It's my great pleasure this afternoon uh, to uh, welcome Sanjoy Ranjan, <clears throat> uh, a good friend of mine, to present to Durham Energy Institute. Uh, Sanjoy is currently a head of the Energy Security Division at the European Investment Bank, and as you saw, we'll be talking on an introduction to European, European Investment Bank and its activities in the energy sector. Um, this remains relevant to us in the UK, and it's something, of course, which is being replicated now in the UK by the uh, uh, UK Infrastructure Bank. <clears throat> so a little about uh, Sanjoy. Um, you will see in the notes which Lynn sent around that he's uh, moved to the <clears throat> EIB from uh, the World Bank um, and is based in Luxembourg. But I know a little more history of Sanjoy. We first met in 1993 when he was a, a rookie engineer joining BP and I was doing my first, and as it turned out, only year since I ended up get posted overseas of uh, opening the the graduate um, program that year. And we spent uh, two weeks on the coast of Dorset um, looking at rocks and... Uh, providing exercises. A big gap after that, and we met again. Sanjoy has reminded me just a few minutes ago, almost 10 years to the day uh, when uh, offshore Spain, a new gas storage facility was initiated and ended up causing uh, quite a number of induced seismic events, which were felt onshore. And uh, myself and my colleague, retired colleague Gillian Forger have been working on that with uh, not just that project but many similar projects since then. But uh, Sanjoy's remit is much wider than uh, chasing down uh, induced seismicity and he's going to introduce uh, that to us today. We're an exalted company because at, uh, at four o'clock our time uh, Sanjoy needs to see the European Commissioner so uh, uh, we're very fortunate to be able to grab him at such a busy time. Just a bit of protocol for the afternoon talk. Sanjay will speak for around about 45 minutes. Uh, whilst he's speaking, please have your uh, microphone off. By all means, have your camera on, but please keep the microphone off. And please add questions into the chat. And at the end of Sanjay's uh, talk, I will invite you to uh, answer those questions, or if you don't have a microphone, I can ask on your behalf. So without further ado, uh, Sanjoy, welcome, I should say welcome back to Durham as a Durham graduate, and uh, even though it's virtual, enjoy the hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I don't know whether I've disappeared from video by now, something has happened to the system. So if it is the case, I apologize, but hopefully my voice will uh, transmit all the way to Durham without any problem. Um, I don't know, Lynn, did you have control of my screen or do I share again? Yeah, you share again. All right, let me... So good afternoon to everyone and uh, you see from the title, I'll talk about the European Investment Bank and particularly focusing on what it does in energy, which is a lot. It's probably, some of you may have heard of it, but it's probably the biggest bank that people haven't heard of. Um, Just a moment, please, Sanjoy. Is, uh, can everyone see Sanjoy's screen? Does no. Um, uh, um, I just got it black. Um, it's black, yeah. Oh, well, let me try again. We we did test, didn't we? Um, yes, successfully, yeah. yes. Um, let me try once more. It says you're sharing the screen, um, but um, we're not There's getting an image. Nothing come up. No. It does tell me it's sharing as well, but... Do you want to log out and log back in yes, again? Yes, I, I think I apologise yeah. for this, but uh, let me give me a minute, please.
<laughs> Don't worry, I'm not to do an, I'm not about to do an impromptu cabaret act in uh, whilst we wait for uh, Sanjoy. We can right. see you. We yeah. can see you now. Yeah, that's that's, slight, that's promising. A slight improvement. And let's see if does this now come up. Perfect. Yes. If you want to, Excellent. right. We're away. Thank you. Um, so sorry about the technical glitch. So European Investment Bank is probably one of the largest banks that people have never heard of, and it's very active in the energy sector, as I'll try to show. What I want to uh, do is to just present what the EIB is, its role, so policy that it follows in the energy sector. I do want to also uh, touch upon its contribution to the e UK energy sector. Of course, after Brexit, this uh, no longer occurs, but there are projects that still exist in the UK that have been financed by uh, the EIB some of the flagship projects and some of the current themes for the EIB in energy, and it's slightly broader than energy as well. So it, it is the Bank of the European Union, not like the ECB. The ECB is like the Bank of England, the central bank. This is a bank for investing in infrastructure. So it is owned and governed by the 27 EU member states. The UK, of course, was one of the large shareholders previously. That no longer is the case. And is in fact, when you look at equivalents around the world, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, EBRD that you may have heard of, actually the EIB is, is the largest uh, lender and borrower, multilateral lender and borrower in the world in that MDB, multilateral development bank space. Um, it was set up in 1958 with the European treaties just for those who may have particular interest in European law, it is actually not a Europe, an EU institution like the Commission or the European Court of Justice. It is a body of the European Union. And this was needed because it's a bank that has to go onto capital markets and so on. So it can't just be an administrative entity. Um, it's very much uh, about crowding in, being the lever to stimulate other banks so uh, most often we're co-financing with other financiers. And in most cases, the EIB cannot finance more than 50% of a project deliberately to ensure space for others. And here, it's also quite interesting, 160 countries, indeed. Um, the focus, the great focus is inside the EU and about 85 to 90% of its lending in any year is inside the EU, but 10 to 15% is outside the EU. Uh, and I'll talk about the areas that this is focused on. And so uh, the, the staff, about 4,000, very centralized in Luxembourg. So there are bankers, engineers, economists, social environmental experts, and so on. And there are offices around the world. These offices don't tend to be very large. They're more representational. But given that we're, we are active in so many countries, these are also very helpful. So last year, how much did we finance? So the EIB group is made out made up of two elements, the bank, and this is EIF, the European Investment Fund, which focuses on more venture capital type of uh, uh, activities. So this was uh, about 77 billion euros. But what's interesting is, let's say, the leverage effect. That 77 billion actually equates to something like, because the ratio, the average that we lend to a project is about 33%. So you multiply that by three, you're at about 240 billion of project cost that the EIB is involved in. One question people may ask is how do these banks work? Where does the money come from? So it's quite important and I think interesting to understand that how banks of this nature work are, first you have the shareholders, so the EU member 
countries who put in an element of capital. So this is called paid in capital. Besides paid in capital, there's callable capital. So in case there's an issue, the bank can call upon capital that has been earmarked in case of issues. With that capital in place uh, and a policy framework regarding what type of projects the bank will be financing, the bank every year goes out and issues bonds on the international uh, financial markets, international capital markets. And so last year, about 45 billion of bonds were issued. Very important that the bank keeps its triple A rating to get the best terms available. The triple A rating is kept by a combination of factors. The fact that the member states are backing it with uh, cap, uh, paid in and callable capital. The fact that the type of projects and the type of due diligence we take ensure that the projects are of good quality and also how the bank manages its balance sheet. The, uh, the percentages shown here show effectively the amount of investor, the, the, the investor makeup across the world. So of all the bonds that the bank issued, 62% were bought by investors in Europe, 13% in the Americas, etc. While I'm on this, it's also worth noting, and it's, an, it's a theme that we hear about much more, is about green finance. And so the EIB, in fact, was the first bank in 2007 to issue a green bond, climate action bond. So it's a bond that is issued, and under that bond, the bank commits to put only projects uh, that comply with uh, climate goals. So under those bonds, we would put energy efficiency, wind and solar projects, for example. So earmarked to that. Last year, we issued about 15 billion in, in climate action bonds. So you see that largest uh, issue of green bonds. And well, one thing on currencies, most of the issuance, so most of the bonds are Euro in Euro, but we also issue we issue in about a dozen currencies, so Euro, US dollar, the pound, uh, yen, and various other currencies as well. Um, so breaking down the uh, last year's results into how much was that, how much of it was it was green. So actually, <laughs> a large amount was green. You remember the overall about seventy-seven billion, so nearly fifty percent was was green. Split amongst various um, elements. There are energy elements, renewable energy, energy efficiency. There are other elements as well regarding uh, RDI, adapt adaptation, environmental sustainability, which could be in water uh, and so on. So this is very much a theme. The bank has an objective in this decade to lend, you know, up to and beyond 50% of its annual lending to green investments. That's a target that was set uh, two or three years ago. Last year, in fact, if we add everything up, uh, including adaptation, mitigation, and environmental sustainability, it was 58% of the bank's lending. How do we go about our work in terms of uh, uh, in terms of, let's say, the, the lending side. So we saw the bond issuance is the borrowing side, taking money from the capital markets. Projects, we, we can receive proposals from promoters of projects. We receive proposals from governments, from municipalities. One of the first things we have to do, and we put it as appraisal, but actually it's about eligibility. Is a project at all eligible? Does it fit? within our framework. There are some areas and sectors which are simply ineligible for the bank. It, for example, from 2019 onwards, the bank took a policy decision, and this in, in fact is goes beyond the European Union's uh, requirements. The bank no longer finances any fossil fuel project. Similarly, the bank, and this you can imagine is quite a debate, the bank does not finance defense, the defense sector. You can imagine, as I say, in the EU at the moment, this is a very um, heated debate. Um, 
after the eligibility is confirmed, there's the due diligence. Also, I, I, I think I can say that John and Gillian have been helping recently on that. So technical assessments of a particular project, uh, getting you know, details beyond, you know, giving us input beyond the bank's own expertise in some sub subsurface matters. After that, we have our management committee and then the board of directors. Management committee are politically appointed uh, executive management. There are nine of them. Uh, until Brexit, Britain had a permanent role on the nine person management committee. Uh, it's still nine person, but the, the, the permanent roles are France, Germany, and Italy now. And then the other six seats rotate between countries. And the board of directors is made up of uh, mem uh, nominees from each of the countries plus one from the European Commission. We then negotiate the loan contract and then there are disbursements. We also monitor the outcomes of the project uh, until final repayment. So I think from what I've said and the let's say the the moniker that the bank likes these days is the European Investment Bank, the EU Climate Bank. And here, these things shouldn't be too surprising for you. I mean, many banks will do this, but we, I think we put a particular emphasis on this and really want to um, get into details on the environmental, social, human rights uh, uh, sides. I've already talked about the, the exclusions and um, we, we're in this zone of being fully public, rather large. So we also get quite a lot of scrutiny, um, NGOs, civil society organizations. So we try to meet the best transparency requirements in that area as well. We always have, I, I think like, <laughs> you know, anything, we have room to improve, to learn, to move with EU directives. And it's useful, maybe people would ask, yes, a lot of EU directives, how does this work for a bank? So I think a good way to put it is, of course, we are not fundamental EU policy makers. So we take EU policy, EU policy applies to us, and we're one of the few multilateral development banks who actually can be taken to court. We can be taken to the European Court of Justice. The World Bank, there's actually no, no judicial authority where you can take the World Bank to. We can be taken to court. Um, but what we do with EU policy is we have to interpret it for a banking purpose because we cannot, we cannot exceed EU policy, but we can be more restrictive than EU policy as we, as we are on fossil fuels. And we have to interpret EU policy in terms of what could it do to our balance sheet, what could it do to our credit risk and so on. So therefore, one may see some deviations from the maximum boundaries that EU policy may have regarding what we choose to do in a slightly smaller frame than the larger EU policy. In terms of energy, so our last, let's say, energy policy review, policy for the bank, was in 2019. And it was the biggest element, and I think it was a surprise because it was eventually quite a fraught board discussion um, was that we said we're stopping financing fossil fuels. We, if anyone reads our policy document, we say we fully understand in particular for gas that there is a role for gas to play in the transition. But our view is that the investment requirements for the transition are so high that we would want to focus our uh, uh, our resources on these four sectors in, in the energy domain. Energy efficiency, effectively renewables, renewables and low carbon, if you like, innovation and networks, broadly networks and storage. I mean, run, in the run up to 2019, you can see the type of um, breakdown that we had for lending. So if you like, the element at the top was the fossil lending. There was a small grandfathering period. And we see that energy efficiency and renewables are really uh, moving up 
and there's a lot of demand for our investment in that sector. And again, as I say, about 90% of that is within the EU. So last year, you see, it was nearly 20 billion euros. So again, taking the factor of three, that's supporting about 60 billion of projects. Of that 20 billion, about 2 billion was outside the EU and 18 billion was inside the EU. Just a bit on EU policy, because that sort of flows into what we're doing. The EU has most recently announced its Fit for 55 package, so at least a uh, you know 55% reduction in emissions. Renewable energy, energy efficiency are key areas. This is just to show uh, also with the repower last year, with the, the, the switch from Russian gas that was needed. This is just to show that if not, you know, word by word, our overall policy framework is very aligned with the EU framework. I mean, I, I mentioned, for example, you see gas infrastructure, oil infrastructure. This is still fine for the EU. We would not be able to do that. And I, I think what one can imagine that last year with the Russian gas crisis, um, we were under a lot of pressure to get back into fossil fuels. And we said we would prefer to step up, in fact, um, on renewables and grids and so on, because that is where the long-term need is. And we made no policy change, uh, and that was accepted by our shareholders. So a bit more detail in renewables. So what are we doing? Mainly PV and wind, but there are other renewables. There's hydro, there's geothermal, uh, biogas, biomass. So. We, we focus on that breadth of renewables and uh, we, we, we have different financial products for this. One of the things, and you'll see when I come to the UK, one of the things we were heavily involved in pre-Brexit was the North, North Sea offshore wind and the so-called OFTOs, offshore transmission operators and so on. So we, if one looks at the evolution of offshore wind in Europe, and the UK has and continues to play a big role in it, the EIB was heavily financing those investments, in fact. Other element, and this is very much discussed these days, is the hydrogen side. I, I mean, I think what we're seeing is there's a lot of need just on renewable electricity generation. How to fit enough in for hydrogen is, of course, and mobility. This, uh, this is, you know, <laughs> there are some constraining factors, but we also are stepping into hydrogen when there are projects that uh, we, we find that can make sense. Energy efficiency, uh, sometimes this seems to not be spoken about enough because it doesn't seem to be a big, you know, you can't show a big, nice picture of a PV farm or wind farm, but um, we really try to step up in this, and you may have remembered from our investment, it really has moved up. Our main challenge is aggregating rather small energy efficiency into large, larger projects. Typically, the EIB doesn't lend uh, less than 25 million euros. So that means you need an overall project of 50 million euros. And to get this, you know, when you're talking about residential buildings or even some public buildings, it's quite difficult. So aggregation and then having a clear, consistent and replicable process to step up on energy efficiency is what we aim for more and more. But we don't always find it easy, but there's still a decent appetite. As you say, it's moved from in 10 years from 1 billion to 7 billion. So that's already a big shift. Electricity networks, I think these we see coming much more into the news that people start realizing that for every gigawatt or megawatt of new renewable capacity you put in, you actually need a significant amount of grid capacity. And not just grid, but storage as well, probably. Um, and these are things that we, I mean, we're used to financing, we do distribution programs, transmission programs, uh, uh, cross-country, uh, intercontinental even, um, uh, interconnectors to link the EU uh, better. 
we are starting to step in more to storage and batteries but this also i mean we we can't we can't create the project we have to have the promoters come a lot of this is also linked to regulatory issues how much storage could transmission system operators have distribution system operators and i don't know what the status is in the e in the uk these days but in the eu there's a famous term called state aid whether you know these companies are actually allowed to do this and benefit from let's say favorable financing these are many of the steps that we have to go through uh, in these sectors so i mean for example this type of project offshore germany um 150 million financing and i just want to point out this element the european fund for strategic investments this was something put in place in about 2015 and what this is is effectively it's a eib and european commission financial instrument what is that it's basically it's not quite a pot of money but it's a pot of money if you need it it's a guarantee that says look if this project has an issue paying back this guarantee can kick in so what does this do this means the project can actually be financed at a lower cost because there's someone who's going to take what's called the first loss piece in case there's a problem with the project so this ran from about 2015 to 2020 the successor to it is called invest eu which gives guarantees to projects which may normally be a bit risky this guarantee allows the risk to come down a bit and therefore you can lend at a at, at terms which are more attractive and therefore hopefully multiply the the investments in core sectors um you can see i think you you can read the the other details another one and this is much more recent it i think we did this last year early last year so this is one of our first electrolyzer projects it um it's pv um electrolysis and then the green hydrogen goes into a fertilizer plant um this is up and running but actually what has happened it's not necessarily right now producing hydrogen at full capacity because in the recent year the past year electricity prices on the market have been so high that the arbitrage between selling the pv into the market versus continuing with steam methane reform gas has meant that the electrolyzer hasn't been working as much as it could but this is one of the first uh, hydrogen uh, green hydrogen projects that uh, we've done and we hope to do more i think the only let's say policy point i'd make is we generally see that it's far easier to do hydrogen at an existing demand point than having to build the demand itself certainly at this stage uh this is interesting because this connects france to ireland across the celtic sea and this is one of many interconnectors that we finance i mean we finance electricity and gas interconnectors from great britain to the continent as well this is a fairly recent one these sorts of projects in the eu uh there's a particular classification for certain transport energy and digital projects which are called projects of common interest so projects which which uh benefit two or me more member states and this is one so ireland has a means even though ireland is also interconnected with with great britain um ireland has a means of accessing another market uh with it, if it has excess wind likewise if france would have excess nuclear this is a a good means of having that cross border trade whilst also enhancing uh, security of supply now to the uk so the uk joined the eu and the eib in 1973 this is you know all the projects that we've done and uh over 1000 projects uh 118 billion so this is in i mean a, a sum of money of the day so you know 1973 if it was 20 million we just summed it 
but I would hazard a guess that you can easily multiply that 113 by about three to bring it up to today's terms. So, I mean, we wouldn't be far off 350 to 400 billion in terms of the financing. Again, you see energy is actually the largest element, uh, but there are many other elements as well. Um, services, I think transport and water are also quite important. What, what did this mean, uh, I think, in terms of the UK and in energy? I, I've done this word cloud, and this is a word cloud uh, of actually all the energy projects that the EIB um, financed in energy. But to save you too much, uh, <laughs> too much decryption, let me just name a few. And in naming them, I think one can also see the transition of energy in the UK. So there were, for example, National Coal Board's coal mines in the early 70s. There was Hartlepool nuclear power plant. There was Denorwick pump storage, Thistle and Ninian oil field. Haitian nuclear plant, Urenco Urim, uranium enrichment, cross-channel inter electricity interconnector, so on. I mean, Liverpool Bay, oil and gas, Isle of Grain, LNG terminal. And then we start moving to UK renewable, London Array, offshore wind farm, offshore transmission network, Sheringham Shoal, offshore wind farm, um, national grid uh, upgrade. So... I think even in that 45 year period or so, one can see the transition of the energy sector in Europe, in the UK, the North Sea itself, a lot of oil and gas, 70s, 80s, moved in in the late 2000s to, uh, to offshore wind, the, the transmission networks. Another aspect, nuclear. Yes, uh, EIB is actually... I think the only bank of its nature that can finance nuclear. There are very strict safeguards. It's only for within the EU. And you may spot, I mean, not only were there brand new nuclear plants, but there was also the nuclear fuel cycle. Nuclear in the EU is back in discussion. And uh, this, <laughs> this also happens, nuclear happens to sit with me. I mean, many other technologies as well. But I think you can imagine that... Uh, I have to exercise my political diplomacy to the utmost when dealing with nuclear in particular. Themes that are ongoing, and these are somewhat cross-cutting, not just energy. So the EU somehow trying to uh, complement, let's say, <laughs> the US IRA has announced its Green Deal Industrial Plan. And essentially, a lot of this is about more manufacturing of technologies for the energy transition in the EU, having better access and investment in the chain of critical raw materials. So the EIB has also, under, the, under its own policy, to see what it can do to mirror that EU policy, put forward, um, put forward areas where the EIB uh, can can work. So, for example, until now, we haven't really been involved in the manufacturing, let's say, of wind turbines. But we agreed in July that this is something we should uh, work on more. We should work on more of the uh, the processing, etc., of uh, critical raw materials. This isn't something we've really done for the time being. So these things are now starting. Again, a broader issue. Uh, is regarding how we look at social and human rights uh, matters in the energy sector. There are international and European um, laws, uh, treaties, etc. And we have to try and make these work with the promoters we're financing. Um, a major issue at the moment is how does one guarantee the integrity of the PV panel supply chain? Unlike the US, which has put in sanctions effectively the eu has not so this means we have to find ways to receive sufficient not just comfort but contractual undertakings 
that we can work with a promoter and where they're sourcing things from. It's not necessarily so straightforward, but this is something we're learning and building upon. Now, outside uh, the EU, as I said, and you saw 160 countries, so you can take, you know, 27, let's say 30 off, that means 130 countries outside. Energy continues to be a major element of our investment there. And the areas where the focus goes to more or less, not necessarily in volumes, but in terms of where we look to first, are these, the energy community is essentially the Western Balkans. And these are generally so-called accession and candidate countries for the EU. So they're putting in EU legislation, Eastern neighborhood, it's most of the former Soviet Union. We, we by sanction can't work in Russia for a long time. We used to, but we do, you know, Moldova, Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, etc. Southern neighborhood, East Mediterranean, Turkey, North Africa. So these are the areas that, let's say, have the first focus on our outside EU activity. And then we work in Sub-Saharan Africa, better Latin America, and also in Asia. And our focus almost entirely in energy is to, uh, to really push for renewables, grid, grid support, and where we can energy efficiency. But again, this issue of aggregation is just, it becomes quite difficult in some cases. So it's probably more renewables and uh, electricity grids in these countries. One, one topic as well, and I think it's worth mentioning, I, I think Durham works on this a bit, is the issue of decarbonizing heat. Many of these countries in the Balkans, Ukraine, Moldova, they have district heating, for example, and decarbonizing heat, they may have coal, it may be moving to gas, but how do you get scale decarbonization? There probably won't be sufficient biomass. John will know about this as well, that geothermal can and should probably play a bigger role, something we can discuss uh, perhaps in the questions in the, uh, later. Some examples of projects that we've done outside the EU, so a pretty large wind power plant, Lake Tukana, is a relatively remote area of Kenya. And this was a very large one. This was financed under a so-called project finance, so special purpose vehicle that uh, only owns that wind farm and from which we are paid back. This is running very well. Um, geothermal in Costa Rica, uh, and let's say, I mean, I, I've just chosen these to give a spread a bit. I mean, we, we do these in other countries as well. And then uh, in Morocco, uh, this uh, photovoltaic, which again is a relatively large one. And um, we also work in Morocco to uh, expand and strengthen the power grids, for example. So this was where I just wanted to end now, giving you a little run through what the bank is, it's a you know, pretty, um, let's say, unusual structure if you don't know about these things. But perhaps to show you that um, actually we, we're doing quite a lot, even though we're doing quite a lot in terms of what is needed, it's still a relative drop in the ocean, but it makes a difference in, for example, these countries, which I'm just showing on this slide. So perhaps with that, I end, and I think I'm more or less on time as well. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sam Joy. I, that was delightful. You know, despite having worked together for 10 years now, I had really very little appreciation of the the breadth and depth of, of what you would, what your role is and the EIB in general. We have one question in the chat. Julian, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Uh, enjoy. So uh, the question I have is essentially, can the EIA subsidize to some extent potential losses of a project? Um, so for example, say the project is you think it's going to function well for 90% of the time, but throughout the lifetime, there might be 10% of the time where project might lose some money. Uh, and due to the realities of, you know, cash flow and all that stuff, these would put the project at potentially risk of failing. 
can you say we will give you a bit more money say in the question um if you need if you can't afford to buy your electricity more than 70 pounds per megawatt hour to be able to sell your hydrogen that you're producing um and make a profit will pay you if the price goes up to say 80 megawatts hour for a while so that you can keep going you can keep the supply chain you can keep your customers um so that you can you can go through that difficult time and then when you become profitable again you can uh, carry on with the repayment is that something that's um a possibility as part of the um, of the uh yeah financing plans for a project i hope that makes sense Typically, if we appraise and agree to finance a project, you would not have such a mechanism in. What you would have is we would have a view of electricity prices, which we, we, we then model our economic and financial decisions on. However, you know, we know life is, is not, uh, not, not doesn't replicate models. Um, uh, so in cases where these sorts of things happen, we we would engage closely with the borrower and undertake restructurings to say, OK, now you're not you, there's not enough money. What can we do? Would it help if we lengthen the loan period, for example, or okay. it wouldn't be so it wouldn't be so blunt as to say, oh, it's this price per megawatt hour. Because it would be more, how can you ensure that your loan repayments occur uh, maybe over a, length, a longer period? Or are we asking you to put too much, you know, in project finance as a term of debt service uh, reserve account where we, or we, we say, you, you know, we limit the amount of dividends someone could pay. So we may at the beginning say, OK, you can only dividend X percent. You come to a crunch, you say, OK, maybe we tighten that dividend thing a bit. You know, you tighten the dividends, we extend the lifetime a bit. And that that's how we'd approach it, because we, we try, you know, we try to be conservative and not too conservative. If you're too conservative, you end up financing nothing. Um, but uh, that's the approach we take. And you may have seen on one of my slides something called monitoring. So yeah. it's not that we just give the money and we say, bye bye, just keep paying us back. We actually engage more than that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. I, no one else put a question up just yet. I wondered. Uh... Oh, Simon. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. So, so interesting. You, you told us a lot about the kind of projects that you that the bank funds and the, the way it organizes its funding. Could you say a little bit about which? Uh, like about the recipients of funds, who who are they? What forms do they take? Yes, and I, I, I think, John, you mentioned those the gentlemen from SSE, and I believe we've funded them. But, the, I mean, the bulk of our financing, let's say, can break down into public sector. So that means it can be governments, municipalities, and so on. Corporates. So corporates can be utilities, they can be, you know, so listed companies, corporate, the, the, the transmission system operators, the wind farm developers. They can be typically not for major energy projects, but maybe for energy efficiency, small and medium enterprises, energy efficiency, for example, because they wouldn't be doing huge projects. Um, they can also be, we have a small window for equity, so certain equity funds, let's say there's an equity fund that is um, that is uh, doing, let's say, off-grid off -grid solar in Africa, yeah? We could put some equity into that, uh, for example. So that's, those are, that's a sort of spread of borrowers that we would encounter typically. Thanks, and uh, that your mention of SSE has prompted Ian to uh, raise his yellow hand. Yeah, uh, so enjoy that was I, I was at SSE ten years ago, and uh, EIB were one of our major uh, uh, lenders, at them, typically for network upgrades, uh, which would to facilitate renewable energy. 
Uh, I was, we found a good counterparty, if a little, if a little bureaucratic at times, if you needed to, to move quickly. But my question, Sanjoy, you mentioned that you have the, I think you call the EIF, the VC. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in what more emerging technologies or, or VC type things that the EIB does, rather than the sort of classic infrastructure lending that I know well. So in the energy field, I, I, actually, I, I should start by maybe not the energy. We were one of the early funders of BioNTech, by the way. So even before COVID, we had identified mRNA as a promising sector. We do finance health and we put money into BioNTech. It just, I mean, OK, we, one could say we were lucky, but, uh, but in the energy field, there are battery technologies which are let's say more innovative there yeah. is a certain amount of carbon capture some of the direct carbon capture some of the uh you know uh, the capture to uh like in iceland uh, to to actually solidify carbon there's um what other things are we looking at in energy, I'm just trying to think of some of them. I mean, some you know different types of carriers for hydrogen, for example. Yeah. Um, so we do those sorts of things, smaller scale. I, I mentioned something called European Fund for Strategic Investment. So some of those also benefit from a European Commission guarantee to help reduce the risk a bit, because let's be clear, the EIB does not give grants. Everything we do is to yes. be repaid. But if the commission has a particular area of interest, this can occur. Oh, another thing, for example, let's say sustainable aviation fuels, these sorts of things. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, one a quick one from me, perhaps to round off. Um, I'm just getting to grips with the, U the new UK Infrastructure Bank. I'm wondering, is there any formal or even informal link between the EIB and the Emergent UK Bank? I believe, and I think you introduced me to Bridget Rosewall, was it? I did, um, yes. And we, we have spoken. Oh, good. And I think there is some informal discussion. It would be quite difficult for there to be something formal these days. But of mm. course, you know, best practice and all that. And yeah. actually... I mean, Brexit occurred, but we still have many ongoing loan operations in the UK that are repaying. So there is still yeah. activity, but uh, no new activity. I, I, there was one interesting, actually, a year ago or so, we financed an island, uh, it's Island UK, Island to Wales, actually, electricity interconnector. Mm -hmm. But we could only finance a cost that would be incurred, I mean, very clearly by the Irish. Yes. So yeah. that's the type of uh, uh, thing. But I'm sure, I mean, there are many people in the UK who, I mean, who have worked with the EIB previously and, uh, you know, I think know it fairly well. And mm -hmm. I take Ian's point on, yes, the bureaucracy a bit, because um, there are various steps to go through for any loan. The European Commission has to say, OK. The government has to say okay, even if it's not to the government. So it's not it's not a commercial bank in that sense where you just internally decide. There are external parties who also have to give their okay. So that indeed slows things down a little bit. But on the other hand, and I don't know whether Ian would agree with this, we tend to we tend we tended to be even in the UK able to give longer tenors than typical commercial banks would. Uh, and more, and also built relationships with institutions. So you would do repeat business. It was yes. more relationship and less transactional than a commercial bank. You just okay. have to work hard on the relationship. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have one of our PhD students. Uh, I'm going to ask them to give the uh, final question. Ankita Garg, do you want to show yourself before, as, and ask the question? You no, know, okay, ask away. We're not picking up. 
well, I will ask for you. Perhaps you don't. Your um, your microphone's not working. And the question is a very direct one: What are the potential opportunities for PhD students to be part of the European Investment Bank? So um, typically, I mean, I guess most people hear energy, and you know, how can they work on energy in the IB? Typically, I mean, we'd recruit people with a certain amount of experience because you need to have a certain amount of experience in order to be credible when you're going to talk with SSE, example, <laughs> for example. Um, so typically people come with about seven, seven or eight, at least seven or eight years of, let's say, experience in the sector. Um, the other nuance is that one has to be a national of an EU country. So, so although, no although our general procurement rules ask for international procurement, international tendering, the human resource procurement is EU nationals. No chance of a new career for me then, uh, Sanjoy. <laughs> that, that, that was a, a really fascinating talk. I really did. Uh, learn a lot and uh, enjoy it too. And I'm sure that was that goes for everyone who's on the call. These video calls are never very good for saying thank you, but uh, you know, at least you'll hear me clapping. So thank you very much indeed. Great. No, uh, pleasure, John, and to others. And yeah, I hope it, as I say, I hope it opens your eyes to the biggest bank you've never heard of.